evening. Good evening. Hello. Thank you, Dawn. You're welcome. Right. <laughs> My colleague, I love her. Uh, so good evening and welcome to the final lecture of the 2016 through 2017 Humanities on the Edge Speaker Series. For those of you who don't know me, I am Jeanette Eileen Jones, Associate Professor of History and Ethnic Studies and the lead organizer of this academic year series on post-racial futures, question mark, which features four amazing scholars whose scholarship invites us to consider the ways in which race has shaped our past, operates in our present, and will continue to shape our future if we do not interrogate its limitations and the promises of post-racial ideologies. Before I talk about tonight's speaker, let me tell you a little bit about the Humanities on the Edge speaker series. It was created by my colleagues and co-organizers, Marco Abel in the back, Roland Bakeshow, um, Marco is chair of the English department and is professor of English and film studies and Roland is associate professor of English and vice chair of the English department and they started this series in 2010. I joined the organizing team in 2011 and this year we welcome to our organizing team Carrie Morgan, Carrie, <laughs> curator of academic programs at the Sheldon Museum of Art. Each year we select a specific topic for the series and invite our speakers to address it through their specific disciplinary expertise. For year seven, we selected post-racial future, futures in response to the incredible, or increasingly, excuse me, visibility of race in U.S. national and international public discourses. In the U.S. context, folks were quick to declare that we were living in a post-racial moment because we had a black biracial president. But as Obama ran a nation supposedly in a post-racial present, or at least on the cusp of a post-racial future, vigilante and police killings of unarmed black women, men, and children garnered attention and launched, launched the Black Lives Matter movement. Concurrently, the war on terror exacerbated racialized Islamophobia in the US and across Europe. Responses to the so-called Syrian crisis is a current manifestation of this discourse. The ongoing racialized debate over immigration in the United States continues to divide the nation as people imagine the pejorative illegal alien as a Latino rapist, drug dealer, or welfare seeker. The Trump administration's rhetoric reveals that race is all around us as he talks of Muslim bans, his words not mine, bad hombres, biased Mexican judges, black folks living in post-industrial crime-ridden urban hellscapes, and make claims that um, the blacks, the Muslims, and the Hispanics love him, yet sees them as threats. The visibility of white supremacists and neo-confederates in U.S. political culture and government proves that post-raciality is a fiction. Our speakers this academic year recognize and grapple with post-racial racism, as described by legal scholar Ian Hef Haney Lopez in his 2010 article for the California Law Review. Lopez called, Lopez called on scholars to interrogate and challenge post-racialist discourses and calls for post-racial futures and images of post-racial societies, particularly those that refuse to acknowledge racism as a systemic and structural violence that forecloses such post-racial possibilities. So I repeat, as a systemic and structural violence, which is to say that it is not a matter of a few bad apples or rogue cops or individual people who we can blame for our current troubles. So if you will, permit me a brief review of our past three speakers before I talk about tonight's speaker. Milton S.F. Curry, Associate Dean of Academic and Strategic Initiatives and Associate Professor of Architecture at the University of Michigan, spoke on September 22nd 2016. His lecture, Racial After Images of Architecture Ideology, called for an architecture race theory that acknowledges black agency. On October 13th of the same year, Sue J. Kim, professor of English and co-director of the Center for Asian American Studies, and a Nancy K. Donahue endowed professor in the arts at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, developed, de uh, delivered her lecture, Postmodern Fatigue, Postracial Fallacies. She discussed how postmodernism continues to inform how we think about race. 
In particular, she explained how what she calls otherness postmodernism privileges and celebrates difference, heterogeneity, and multiplicity while ignoring or even exacerbating institutional racial hierarchies in the US and globally. On March 2nd of this year, Alexander DeCoster, um, assistant professor of theoretical, cultural, and international studies and education at the University of Alberta, presented his lecture towards hemispheric critique of the post-racial, drawing connections between the United States, Brazil, and Canada, his talk took a broader historical and spatial perspective on the post-racial to ask, what can we learn and do about hemispheric racial formations through an analysis that draws together expressions of post-racial thought and discourse from very diverse locations in the Americas? In what ways does viewing the post-racial hemispherically allow us to not only identify and understand its various permutations, but also perhaps forge solidarity across related place-based struggles against racism. Tonight, Kirsten Buick, professor of art history at the University of New Mexico, will present her talk, Slavery Makes the Woman, Historical and Racial Linkages in the Creative Practices of Mary and Monia Lewis and Kara Walker. A more formal introduction will come later. But we have been excited about this lineup for the 2000. 16 and 17 uh, series, and the Humanities on the Edge program is still going strong. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about next year, our eighth year, 2017-18. We will focus on post-revolutionary futures, and once again, we will bring in four speakers, two in the fall and two in the spring. We're especially excited about our eighth year's focus because it is inspired by both the upcoming 100th anniversary of the Russian October Revolution in 1917, and the 50th anniversary of the global revolutionary events known as 1968, a moment when students and workers in countries across the world, including the United States, France, Germany, Czechoslovakia, Chile, Mexico, South Africa, Tunisia, Japan, and China, pushed for radical political and cultural changes all over the world. Many scholars consider 1968 the last truly revolutionary era we have witnessed to date. Error because most scholars argue for conceptualizing 1968 as a long 68, from the late 1950s through the late 1970s, with 1967 and 68 marking a particularly important period in some, but not all, all of the above listed countries, and there are others as well. So if you have your calendars, get them out. <laughs> the speakers will be on September 28th. Timothy Scott Brown, professor of history at Northeastern, he will provide the introductory lecture explaining what 1968 was about and anchor it in examples from the United States and Germany. On October 19th, Ronald Judy, professor of English at the University of Pittsburgh, will discuss events in Tunisia and North Africa, Northern Africa during 68. In the spring, we have um, confirmed Tim Deal, professor of English at the University of Illinois, Illini, who will discuss how to, um, how discussions of sexualities was changed by 1968. So let me take now uh, time to thank our sponsors and supporters. As you know, it takes uh, collaborations to put on humanities programming these days. Without the generous support of Nebraska Cultural Endowment and, human and uh, Humanities Nebraska, and the departments of English, History, Sociology, Teaching, Learner, and Teaching Education, Modern Languages and Literature, the Institute for Ethnic Studies, Women's and Gender Studies, African and African American Studies, Latina, Latino and Latin American Studies, the College of Architecture, the Sheldon Museum of Art, the LGBTQA Resource Center, UNL's Faculty Senate, and UNL's Research Council, we would not have been able to bring our speakers to our campus. <laughs> So if you have this pink sheet, please fill this out. This is the survey for Humanities Nebraska. And they would like to hear your feedback on tonight's event. Um, we would also like to thank Anthony Holly. Are you here, Anthony? Oh, who um, came up with our beautiful programs and, or excuse me, posters and postcards. Um, he's been working on with uh, Hadi from its inception, is my understanding. Um, NET Radio for allowing us to promote our events on their Friday live show. And also the Watershed Blog. Are any, any people here from the Watershed Blog? Thank you. Um, a collective 
a, a, the Watershot Blog Collective, a group of graduate students who run an independent blog of critical theory at watershedblog.com. Since, since starting the blog two years ago, they have published many excellent blog posts on various topics, as well as blogs on our guest work and our lecture events. I would also like to send special thanks to Dylan Rockmore, are you here? And Jamie Brunton, who helped me with uh, grant writing um, through this entire process. So please join me in giving a big round of applause to all of our supporters. <laughs> We're getting to the moment you're waiting for. Let me just say, um, it's the time to take out your cell phones. If you're on sp Facebook, please like our Humanities on the Edge um, page and follow our Twitter handle at UNLHOTE. Um, and feel free to tweet and post during this lecture. So tonight's speaker, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Kirsten Pye Buick. Professor Buick earned her BA in Art History and Italian Literature at the University of Chicago. Her MA in Art History from the University of Michigan with a focus on art, on the art of the United States and Italian Renaissance art. And her PhD in Art History also from Michigan with a focus on art of the United States and African American art. During her doctoral program and immediately after, she worked at the Art Institute of Chicago and taught at Williams College and in Florence, Italy for a study abroad program. After earning her doctorate, she taught at the University of Chicago, Bard Graduate Center, and Bard College before joining the Faculty of Art and Art History at the University of New Mexico as Assistant Professor of Art History. She served as interim chair of her department and is now Professor of Art History. In 2010, Professor Buick published Child of Fire, Mary Edmonia Lewis in the Problem of Art History's Black and Indian Subject with Duke University Press. I realize I just left my book in my bag. It's so good. But you can purchase Professor Buick's book in the Sheldon Museum, Art Museum Bookstore at the conclusion of this talk, and she is happy to sign up. Um, Professor Buick has published essays in numerous anthologies and in scholarly journals such as American Art. She is currently working on two book projects, Inauthenticity, Kara Walker and the Identics of Racism in preparation for Duke University Press, and White Skins, White Masks, the performance of race in British colonial portraits and in the visual culture of slavery. Professor Buick's accolades are many. Uh, she was a Smithsonian, pre Smithsonian pre-doctoral fellow at the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, D.C and held the Charles Gaius Boland Fellowship in Art History at Williams College. I want to especially highlight one award. In 2015, she was the recipient of the David C. Driscoll Prize. For those of you who don't know this prize, it was established by the High Museum of Art in 2005 and is the first national award to honor and celebrate contributions to the field of African American art in art history. Named after the renowned African-American artist and art scholar, the prize recognizes a scholar or artist in the beginning or middle of hers or her career whose work makes an original and important contribution to the field of African-American art or art history. And it comes with a hefty catch for <laughs> Tonight, Professor Buick will explore how artistic interpre interpretations of slavery have varied little over time, especially those representations by African-American women. Edmonia Lewis and Kara Walker garnered great fame because of their presumed association with enslavement and the reaffirmation of that association through their artwork. Buick's talk will explore the national and international fascination with representations of slavery and how two black women ably negotiated that fascination to become both producers and products of race. So quickly on a personal note, I taught uh, Kirsten's book this semester in my African American Women's History Crafts. Have y'all here? Um, I was so excited to be teaching a book about art history for the first time and my students. Um, and I had a very vibrant conversation, discussion about that, and the legacy of Mary Edmonia Lewis. So thank you for that book that really changed how I taught that section of um, the class. So please help me um, welcome our 29th. 29th, Humanities on the Edge speaker, Professor Kirsten Pye. Thank you, Jeanette. <coughs> Time's up, right? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, good evening. And 
thank you all for coming tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to see all of you here. Uh, I've enjoyed the town of Lincoln very much. It's very charming. It's a little too humid. But, um, I'd also like to extend my thanks to Marco Abel, Chair and Professor of English, Humanities, On the Edge co-organizer, Roland Bakeshow, uh, Susan J. Rosowski, Associate Professor of English and Vice Chair of Humanities on the Edge, uh, co-organizer, Carrie Morgan, Curator of Academic Programs at the Sheldon Art Museum and Humanities on the Edge, co-organizer, Jeanette Eileen Jones, Associate Professor of History and Ethnic Studies and Humanities on the Edge, co-organizer, Joy Castro, Professor of English and Director of the Institute of Ethnic Studies, the African and African American Studies Program, the Sheldon Art Museum, Wally Mason, Director and Chief Curator of the Sheldon Museum of Art, the Department of History, the Department of English, Nebraska Humanities, and finally, Nebraska Cultural Endowment. You see from um, a snapshot I took of an article written by Elizabeth Johns about Thomas Aikens' Gross Clinic. And uh, all, it says, although as late as 1876, the New York physician uh, Austin Flint credited Philadelphia with maintaining the medical leadership of America it had established so early, by that time the city had long since been joined by Boston and New York and then New Haven, Charleston, and cities to the west and offering students and professional colleagues anatomical instruction, medical training, professional societies, and publications. Footnote 21. This spread of training and talent to several major medical centers encouraged scientific industry among American medical men, and they began to make original contributions to medicine and surgery. On the right, you see the Gross Clinic by Thomas Aikens from 1875. Two of the surgical contributions, conspicuous even in the large framework of Western surgical progress, were particularly important to American surgeons' self-confidence. First, the discovery of anesthesia in Boston in 1846, making possible intricate, time-consuming surgery that was unthinkable when the patient was conscious, and that turned European eyes to America for the first time, and second, several pioneering gynecological procedures. And you see my note in the margin, the missing footnote. Mm -hmm. Other advances brought American medicine to international attention. The Civil War resulted in American improvements in the treatment of gunshot wounds, the setting up of hospital facilities, etc. And uh, I begin with this to, to kind of preface my talk by saying that I chose a rather unique path in my training as an art historian. In the late 80s and 90s, there was a clear division in scholarship, in large part because of the role of Robert Ferris Thompson at Yale, who trained students to teach African American art as part of the African diaspora. One result was that lines were created in art history departments for the African diaspora, and there was no longer an imperative to teach African American art as part of the history of art in the United States. Despite the fact that US artists trained at the same institutions and jockeyed for representation in many of the same spaces. For example, how many of you know that Grant Wood's first MFA student at the University of Iowa was Elizabeth Catlett? Nevertheless, my decision to train as what was then called an Americanist had very real consequences for my job searches as departments tend to use so-called diversity hires to teach diversity subjects. As an African-American woman who taught American art, I was ostensibly taking up two spaces. This was borne out while interviewing with the University of Delaware and the University of Southern California, when both search committees asked if I was sure that I could teach American art because I had written my dissertation about a woman who is of African and Ojibwe descent. Hmm. Nevertheless, I persevered and took further license in what I was supposed to teach relative to who I was supposed to be. 
I refuse to allow the academy to unmake me. I teach Aikens' Gross Clinic during the second part of my survey of U.S. art. And as someone trained in the art and visual cultures of U.S. art, I understood two things immediately. That Johns is a conscientious and thorough scholar, and that at the time, very few were her equal when it came to work on the painter. However, I also knew the history of medicine and the space between the glaring lack of a footnote about how and why the United States took first place in the practice of gynecology was both puzzling and disheartening. Moreover, to tack the statement onto the end of a sentence about how 1846 was the year that anesthesia made longer and more involved surgeries possible in the US merely added salt to the wound. And here's where my students are steered out of the text and given additional readings, specifically about the father of modern gynecology, J. Marion Sims. The daguerreotype of Drana was part of a commissioned suite of studies of enslaved people by the anthropologist Louis Agassiz, who used the, the daguerreotypes as evidence of variation among African types. They are phrenological, physiognomic, and craniological explorations by the man who would go on to invent the theory of polygenesis, which claimed that only white Europeans descended from Adam and Eve. But what I need you to understand, and what I make clear to my students, is that this is not dehumanization, as we tend to call it. If you understand the history of medicine, the history of anthropology, as well as the history of white supremacy, you will understand that the first two histories have very little to do with the rhetoric of the latter. I also discourage my students from using academic speak, brown bodies or black bodies, uh, for example, as it merely provides a scholarly mirror to the rhetoric of white supremacy. We must talk about people. And to speak of dehumanization in simple formulaic terms works to objectify and other both those both those whom we position as perpetrators and those we position as victims, leaving us unmarked and pure of even the possibility of committing such heinous acts. It fetishizes the human when in actuality, human beings understand very well that we torture and murder other human beings. That understanding rests at the very heart of pleasure. The most profound evidence of this truth is to be found in the encounters of enslaved peoples and the people who owned them, who rented them out, who raped and bred them, and bred with them. We, we can glean some understanding of the embodied experiences of enslaved women like Drana through the work of Sims. Sims was born in South Carolina in 1813 and was a rather mediocre student who concluded his medical studies at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia in 1835 and returned to his home of Lancaster, South Carolina to practice. But after his first two patients, who were white, died, he left South Carolina to practice in Mount Meigs, Alabama. By 1840, he moved his practice to Montgomery, Alabama. In Montgomery, he determined to never risk the lives of his white patients again even as he determined to make a name for himself in the morally questionable field of gynecology. At the time, women suffered a debilitating condition called vesicovaginal fistula, a complication of childbirth that left tears in the bladder and rectum and rendered the women incontinent and socially ostracized. And in fact, they slept in, uh, they tended to sleep in wooden cradles filled with straw because they were leaking urine and feces constantly. Um, so, in a cooperative arrangement with local plantation owners, Sims assembled a group of enslaved women, Anarka, Betsy, and Lucy, who suffered the condition and through trial and error, operating as many as 30 times on one woman without anesthesia. He figured out how to repair the condition. He went, on, he went off to fame and fortune, writing his autobiography and taking his procedure to Europe, 
while the enslaved women, who were his test subjects, went back to the labor of the plantation, bearing children in the form of commodities for their owners and working at their various jobs before they were struck down by the condition. Another path to understanding the embodied experiences of enslaved women in the United States is to be found in President Lincoln's General Orders No. 100, also known as the Lieber Code of 1863. We may wince and become outraged today when we hear politicians creating policy based on their understanding of women's bodies and physiologically how those bodies react during tra traumatic events like rape. Does anyone remember the political wit who theorized that the female body has a way of shutting down mm -hmm. and becoming unresponsive to sperm and therefore no pregnancies actually resulted from rape? These are the men who make policies that govern our bodies and our lives. As a culture, we are constantly negotiating the definition of rape. But in the 19th century, rape was not even a legal possibility for enslaved women until the Lieber Code of 1863, which conceived and defined rape in women-specific terms as a crime against property, as a crime of troop discipline, and as a crime against family honor. And more importantly, the Lieber Code was extended to protect black women. Until that time, a black woman could be forced sexually, but the only time a penalty was levied was if she was forced in the presence of a white woman, in which case the white woman was the actual victim of rape. This proxy rape of white women through the bodies of black women presents us with a conundrum and a question. What does it mean to not be allowed the trauma of your own experiences or body? From medical experimentation to rape, your pain and humiliation, or even your murder belongs to someone else. What does it mean to stand adjacent to the atrocities enacted upon you? What does it mean to be atrocity adjacent? Something similar is at work in the celebration of the careers of Edmonia Lewis and Carol Walker. Both deal with slavery, and both are considered authentic interpreters of an experience that neither woman had. And because they are deemed authentic, they are therefore considered authoritative in their representations. A common thread in all of my work is how authenticity works not as something real or locatable, rather as a strategy that seeks to persuade and police in order to create boundaries of inclusion and exclusion. Authenticity is foundational to identity politics, and it is a high-stakes playing field where notions of empathy and natural empathy are set free. Philosopher Emmanuel Levinas defines empathy as a response prior to the ethical. He notes that it is an act of appropriation that sets the terms of recognition on whether or not the subject can find the ob in the object something of the self. We thereby reduce our objects of empathy to what he calls the way of the same. We can also locate our modern deployment of the term in the realignment of wealth from land ownership to portable commodities, and our relationship to objects during the Enlightenment era. Empathy was direct emotional engagement with objects. Such notions directly contradict what we know of racial formation, not, a result, not as a result of authenticity and empathetic engagement, where we express correct racial traits like breast express milk, but race itself as a construct of racism. It is racism that constructs race. Historian Barbara J. Fields has done for the study of race what Benedict Anderson has done for the study of nation, just as Anderson demonstrated how nationalism is what constructs, reinforces, and maintains nation. Fields has devoted much of her career to revealing how racism constructs, reinforces, and maintains race. Emmanuel Lewis was born free in 1845 in upstate New York 
Her father was African American and her mother was Ojibwe. Orphaned at a young age, she was raised by her mother's people till about the age of 11 when she was sent to New York Central College in McGraw, New York. In 1859, she entered Oberlin College where she was registered as Mary Edmonia Lewis and where she first expressed an interest in art. Leaving Oberlin in 1863, Lewis took advantage of a, writ, a rich network of abolitionists and made her way to Boston with letters of introduction. Once in Boston, she trained with Edward Brackett and made two works directly related to abolitionism and Civil War martyrdom, a coin with a profile of John Brown and a plaster bust of Robert Gould Shaw. For the duration of the war and for a bit afterward, Lewis served as a figurehead of abolitionism, despite the fact that she had never been enslaved and despite the fact that she had equal claim to her indigenous heritage. The direct correlation between blackness and slavery made her an ideal choice. And I would argue that her distance from enslavement also made her ideal, racially appropriate to represent the atrocity adjacent. Lewis had other ideas, however. Representations of race and domesticity were deemed natural and appropriate subject matter for Lewis. She became the poster child for what abolitionism was seeking to achieve more broadly. Not the dismantling of race or racism, rather the end of slavery, with everyone knowing and taking their place within the racial hierarchy. And yet, consistently, in her own works, Lewis attempted to represent a cultural impossibility and a cultural phenomenon that has yet to be realized. The image of a woman who is free. We still do not know what that looks like. However, she did what she could through a series of works that explore the idea of women on the verge of becoming free. Created in 1868, three years after universal emancipation, Forever Free comparatively breaks down the gendered reactions to the news of freedom. The male figure stands triumphantly on the ball and chain that once imprisoned him, raising his fist to reveal the broken chains that once held him as property. His wife, now that freedom has been declared, along with the freedom to marry and set domestic relations to rights, kneels and gives thanks. And yet, her figure is hauntingly reminiscent of the female figure of the slave medallion. Bound and entreating white women to recognize her in an act of empathy, the phrase, am I not a woman and a sister, is her petition for mercy. In Lewis's rendering of Hagar in the Wilderness, she had modeled the sculpture on Donatello's penitent Mary Magdalene, and in so doing has portrayed Hagar, the Egyptian handmaiden to Sarah, as morally aware enough to regret the act of adultery